dedicated to the equitable, cultural and economic reawakening of three blocks of vintage working class Main Street, where her storefront studio is located. Vasa has an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a uh, Master's in Public Art in Public Art Policy. And that's from the University of Washington. Her undergraduate degree is in ceramics from Indiana University. And she wrote a book called The Artist's Guide to Public Art, How to Find and Win Commissions, based on a class that she developed and taught at the Chicago Art Institute. So I would also like to say personally, I've known Lynn a while. We've had her speak at conferences. Um, I am a fan of her work. And um, we gave away, I think, six books last month. Um, and Lynn has spoken about her book, which was the source of inspiration to reach out to her to see if she would be interested in collaborating. So Lynn has voluntarily um, agreed to work on this workshop. Um, so I'm really delighted and thankful to Lynn. So thank you, Lynn, and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you everyone for showing up. Um, the way, this is gonna be all Q&A and the reason I like that so much is because it's the way I work with materials in my, uh, in my studio. Um, I work with encaustic and I just let the materials, I try to remove myself as much as possible and let the materials decide um, the outcome of the piece. And so by doing a, a Q and A like this, because each of you are like very accomplished people who have questions of your own. And by asking your questions, even if everybody doesn't get to ask a question, they will um, surely be asking something that somebody else wants to ask. And in that way, rather than a top down setting of what the question, what the agenda is going to be and what topics are gonna to be covered, we're just gonna go straight to what is most important to you. And I think uh, Nicole has, might have some moderator instructions to, to say. Yes, so you can send your questions directly to me in the chat and I can read them aloud to Lynn. If we start to get a lot at once, uh, you can maybe go ahead and unmute, but we'll see. So um, I'm on here as ISC events. So again, if you send your question my way, I will read it allowed. So I have the chat open and we'll be looking. Um, I'm seeing we're starting to introduce ourselves as well. So that's great. So you may start typing in your questions anytime. And while you're doing that, I'll just yammer and then I'll let Nicole let me know when there when there's a question. But um, I I have I started out as a public artist in by as an accidental public artist, because I, I went to uh, Seattle and Seattle was one of the earliest public art programs in the country. And I got a job as a secretary for the CETA program and uh, found out about this thing called public art. And one of the commissioners was starting a new program at the University of Washington um, uh, in the Masters of Public Administration for uh, public art management and policy. And so I, I wanted to be a full-time artist forever, but I also knew I had a job and my strategy was to keep as close as possible to, um, to the field. And so I went and got a master's degree in that. My undergrad had been in ceramics and um, I was doing a lot of fiber art too, as well as ceramics. But so I got a, a master's degree in that and very quickly I got a job uh, as the curator of the Safeco Insurance Company art collection, which is a which is the public art collection. I mean, it was paintings and, you know, rectangles that hang on the wall. And then um, was recruited from there to start the University of Washington Medical Center's art collection. And um, we collected, you know, thousands of artworks over the 12 years I was there. But while I was building up my practice, um, I was finally able to quit my job. My partner at the time, well, he's still my partner. <laughs> Um, said, you know, do you realize you're losing opportunities by keeping your day job? And so I reluctantly quit like the best day job in the entire world and in 1999 and became a full-time artist and um, just fell off the cliff. And I just had to fend for myself. And so I apply for about 30 public art commissions a year and um, getting that first one is really the hardest, but I'm sure a lot of you have already had your work in public spaces 
and had it well documented. So I don't think you're going to have to um, have take have that first difficult leap. And I see there's some questions. So Nicole, if you want to just start hitting me with them, that'd be great. Okay. Um, let me just look because we have a lot of uh, intros as well. Okay, this one is from Michael Tara. He just finished the book, loved it. Um, can you share any experiences you have had about working with fabricators in other countries? The only fabricator in another country I've worked with is Mosaica. And they're in Montreal and I've worked with them just forever. We've done a ton of projects together. And um, I, you know, they have a good international fabricator will have already worked out shipping the work back to the US or, or the duties and all of that. Is that what your question was mainly re recalling? You can unmute and ask me. Hi, um, actually um, uh, I'm doing a, I've got a 24 foot tall stainless steel piece that's that's uh, under in the works. And um, it's the first time I've worked with an out of country fabricator. So I'm just wondering what sort of international things come up and uh, how do you review the work at a distance successfully? That sort of thing. I used to go there when we first started working together and uh, look at the work, but now I'm, I've worked with them so many times, they just send me progress photos and videos to work with it. Are you having something made in China? I am, I am. I have a piece being made in China and another uh, piece being made in India. So I it's not like I can jump in the Prius and head out there. I had work, I had, I did, uh, had rugs made for many years. I went from doing small scale fiber art to doing art rugs and they were made in Nepal and uh, China. And, um, you either need to have a, a project manager, for lack of a better word, on the ground to go inspect your work. That's, that's abs an absolute must when you're dealing with a third world country. Um, and you, you, can, you can find good people and, and, and hire them and pay them to do that. Do you have anybody like that? Or, or are you just taking the word of the fabricator for, because you have to have them inspect it. I, uh, I haven't gotten that far down the, the pike. I've kind of narrowed down the fabricators that I want to use. I've gotten references from them and talked to the references here in the States uh, and nice. I've gotten good reports. So uh, that was part of my due diligence. Um, no one has talked about having uh, on-site inspectors looking at the work, which is, that's a great answer. So thank you for that. Uh, what would that be called if I was to look for someone? Man, it's been a while since I've 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 had rug, rugs made, but I just I just a client's representative. That's what it would be, a client's representative. Great. So maybe you can find an expat there, or or some like. Um, person, uh, you know, even like if there's a, a gallerist that you know in the business or a curator or somebody there who can and go to the gallery and, uh, I mean, go to the, the factory and get eyes on, eyes on it and um, do the final approval. I, especially with you working for the, with them for the first time. Cool, thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, um, we have another question in the chat um, from Pia. How do you make the decision to shift from one material to another? Thank you for that question, Pia. Um, I, there's this saying that when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I do the opposite thing. I just, um, one size doesn't fit all to me. I really kind of start with what the site is, just like I'm starting with this question and answer. It's like, I'm just starting with, the, with, with who you are, where you're at. And that's what I start with. Uh, I try to start with a blank slate and with no assumptions for each site that I approach. Of course, when you, 
respond to the request for qualifications, you know, you already have some sense of like, does this site call for a, a mosaic or, you know, sometimes they'll say in the RFQ, I want a mosaic. And so, you know, you, you start thinking about that, but more and more are just being like, here's a site, let's let the artists decide what they want to do. And so I recently um, <coughs> uh, proposed a, a cairn, a, a, a huge stone cairn for um, this place in New Jersey, this college called Ramapo College. I didn't win, but um, I, but I found a, a, a master stone stacker to work with up in New England. And um, they're just, and the reason I thought of that is because they have all these stone walls everywhere. And then um, it was the Native Americans who originally lived there and, and some still do. I mean, they, they um, stone cairns were a really important thing for them. And also stone cairns are like a really uh, international, I mean, in Scotland and everywhere, they're, they're just kind of a very primitive uh, form of structure. So I, I propose that. So I'd never done, I'd done a little bit with stone and I, and I like stone, but I just felt like in such a natural rural environment like that, that um, something slick wouldn't, wouldn't work. And I just wanted to use the available materials and more and more to me, materials have meaning and more and more um, I, the first thing I do is I look for what are the natural resources, what are the traditional resources that they've used there for, for centuries, and could that, is that something that could be turned into public art? And also, it's um, environmentally kinder to use uh, the resources that are there. That said, I hardly ever get a chance to do a project like that. The Cairn was the, like one of the first things that I was able to do. My piece in, in Kingsport, North Carolina, mm -hmm. used all local materials, which was like so awesome because it just totally fit with this um, idea they had for retraining a workforce. This, this little town in Tennessee was dying and um, they did a study and found, they used to have like be one of the largest aggregate uh, exporter in the country. Um, Eastman Chemical has had their has their world headquarters in this tiny little town, and um, there was like abundant stone and everything. So everything was like locally fabricated, locally sourced. We had the um, this new polymer that was invented by the uh, by the lab in Eastman Chemical. They did the the ceiling on this little on the shade sculpture that I did outside of their learning center. So um, the short answer, Pia, is it, it, it depends on the project. All right, we got some more. Um, this from Bobby Zokaitis. Have you found certain call platforms or channels to be more generative than others, especially recently with the influx of new users on a call for entry, submittable at all? So the, the question was about the, um, let me see. Do you want me to reread the beginning of it? Yeah. Um, have you found certain call platforms or channels to be more generative than others? And Bobby, you can unmute if you feel you want to clarify. Hi, this is Kara for Zakaita Sculpture. Um, yeah, I, I just know with everybody, um, a lot of people have had a lot more time on their hands given pandemic situations. And so there have been uh, a lot more responses to a lot of the calls that have been published, especially via cafe entry um, or call for entry. Um, we've heard that back from a lot of the administrators and we're just curious if anything has shaken out for you as far as like some platforms or channels being more successful or generative than other ones because there seems to be like an uptick in competition let's say on on some of the more available platforms okay i, I see what you're saying uh for one it's just the same old same old platform it's call for artists it's coda works it's uh, publicartist.org and now any artist um dot org uh and then there are um, you know, the, the ones that like uh, for culture, they, they send out, they aggregate calls for artists and they send them out. But usually it's just those four platforms that I know about. Um, and I, 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 and they start and they repeat some of the calls for artists. But um, as, as a, 
I used to give workshops around the country based on my book. And one of the questions, uh, I'd always have arts administrators come up and they to do put the Q and A like this. And they would always say that just the consensus all around was that um, two thirds of the applications are easy to, um, to get rid of. And the other thing is, I, you'd have to ask an arts administrator if they've seen an uptick in the number of, of submissions. But I just know in general that anything under $100,000 hardly gets any uh, submissions. And every, anything over 100,000 will uh, get a lot. And then it kind of like bell curves down from there. Like if there's you know $700,000 commission, um, they they will be looking for somebody who's done a seven hundred thousand dollar commission or you know something close to that. So then it you know that the field kind of narrows out from there. Did that answer your question at all, Bobby? No, you can ask. You want to follow up if there if that didn't quite answer your question? Yeah. No, that that sounded. Um, okay. There were some helpful things in there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the other thing I've observed is there hasn't been no, there's been no slowdown in the number of requests for artists that have gone out. Like I was afraid it would just dry up <laughs> and it hasn't. I'm not sure why. Great, I will move on to a question from Joe. There's a little bit of background in this one. So Joe, if you need to chime in, feel free. Um, I do wooden kinetic sculpture. I'm interested in a, a large scale, perhaps wind driven kinetic pieces. I've applied for several public sculpture competitions. It seems like they always ask for a portfolio of previous public art. How does a sculptor who hadn't done that before break in? The way to do that, there are a couple of ways that I know of is you apply for, have you applied for RFQs or RFPs? Mostly, have you applied for any RFPs? I don't even know what that is. It's been through um, cafe um, that where there's been public art uh, notices, and I've applied. Well, requests for qualifications are what mostly is out there, and that's where they ask for for your qualifications. Uh, they don't ask for a proposal for for anything specific, and unfortunately, it's. That is, that's really tough um, um, because they will ask to, they have to cover their butts and they don't wanna commission somebody who's a, a first timer. And there are gonna be a lot of people who do have a portfolio, even if it's like of one or two pieces that have, have been completed on time and on budget and they have references. And so they're gonna be the safe bet, um, but you just need to continue um, to a, a apply for those. I mean, one of the things to increase your odds is to make sure it's something that they're actually would accommodate a kinetic sculpture. I'm seeing tons and tons of, and I, I noticed this because I don't enter them because I don't do suspended work or suspended artwork. And it seems to me like at airports and stuff, it seems to me that um, doing kinetic sculpture out of wood, especially would be kind of interesting to start applying for these at these, uh, uh, these other ones. Um, the other way, a, a real tried and true way of doing it is to do a um, request for proposals and usually apply to those. And proposals are where they're asking for something without, um, for just, they're asking for the idea specific to that site. And so people who are um, trying to get their foot in the door with public art are gonna have an easier time. First of all, experienced public artists aren't gonna apply for RFPs because they, they have, they're asking you to work for free. And so people like me don't need to apply for RFPs. The other thing is they're often local and you'll get a more of an opportunity. Um, there'll be less competition if you, if you apply for those. So just be sure you're on every mailing list for like whatever county you live in or you know, just keep your, or what, you know, whatever region you're in. Um, Make sure you're on every single state, local um, mailing list for public art commissions. Cause some of those little ones, they don't make it to call for entry because it's expensive basically for an arts, for an arts um, agency to 
post on call for entry. The, <clears throat> other, the other way to do it, Joe, is um, self-initiate. Do a project in your community and then document the heck out of it. Like, I don't know, find a church or school or a park or, or something and, um, and, and do a public piece there. Because uh, a, a lot of these agencies, they're looking for new blood and they just don't wanna keep commissioning the same old, same old people. Yet at the same time, they need to show that you've taken the initiative to actually figure out how something works in a public space. And um, that will reassure them enough to make you a contender. A uh, question, when you say do a project in the community, do you mean like find a place and donate something if they're interested in taking it? Yeah, if that's what it takes, yeah. yeah. I would say make something and then even a little thing in your studio and Photoshop it into a public place, but they don't, they don't go for that. Everybody's now in their uh, calls for artists or like something that's actually been done. <laughs> Not a mock-up. Well, thank you. This, this is very helpful. I really appreciate the information. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You take care. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And Dora, I saw that you also had a question about RFQ um, versus RFPs. Did you want to add to that at all, or did we answer your question? You can unmute if you'd like, or just let me know in the chat. And uh, keep your questions coming, everyone. Yes, I, I, I teach at Indiana University. So I wear both hats. I try to keep my uh, personal practice alive. And I'm a very classical sculptor, come from Italy. And um, it, it's, there, there, is, there are opportunities, but when the work is, is uh, traditionally, it, it's, it's figurative, it's, um, it's almost a particular genre. <laughs> And uh, on Coda Works, uh, it's really hard to find anything that would fit that category because it moves more towards uh, community generated, uh, mostly um, mine fits pretty much the traditional kind of idea. And so I was just wondering um, where uh, I am trying to, I, ha I'm, I just produced a large sculpture that was more than a million dollars uh, worth. I mean, the production of it cost wow. about more than a million dollars and, and it's a bronze, uh, uh, five athletes coming together um, in a huddle, but it's, it breaks away from the traditional huddle. It, it's about a celebration of teammanship and empowerment that comes from it and, and, uh, and hopefulness in uh, the future and how we can create a future by working together. And I use that idea from sports. And I'm, I'm looking for, hey, I want to do more at this point in my life and, and where do I look? And uh, I just, uh, you answer some of that by mentioning that uh, it is important to, to apply to a lot of RFQs and that's what I'm doing, but I guess I'm not doing enough, <laughs> I should do more. Well, there aren't that many that I see for figurative work and uh, because I don't do figurative, I don't dwell on them. Like when I get an RFQ that doesn't fit my work, I just like, you know, next. Um, so I'm not actually focused on them. I just look, took a quick look at your work and um, it, it is very traditional, but there, I, I think that one of the bather looking like she's ready to dive, there's, there's, there's something um, to that one that's, that seems more contemporary. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, the field is very crowded with, with people who are doing uh, traditional figurative sculpture. But if there's a way that you can distinguish yourself by having it be, I, I don't I don't know, more more timely, more more topical, more like there, there was like again, there was something about that that um, bather that I, I found really interesting. And the glass, the glass piece, like doing it in, in glass. Are you familiar with Nicholas Africano's work? 
um, yeah. his, his glass figurative work. Or, or maybe think about shifting materials. I don't know, do it out of Adobe or something. I, I don't know, but just, I, I think just to start distinguishing yourself in that very crowded field that has minimal opportunities for it. The other thing would be to move more into like, um, and maybe you already do this, is more into the private sector of um, corporate portraits, uh, not corporate portraits, but individual portraits of, of people. Um, so those are my two, like, those are my suggestions. It's like stay traditional and go follow where the interest is in traditional work, which would be like traditional portraiture, private portraiture, stuff like that, and you know, bust um, that people would commission, uh, start working with art consultants. Uh, so that, cause that's your portal to the private sector. And as far as, as public commissions, um, apply for things, but uh, just you know, push yourself more. Like in the South, particularly, I've noticed. I, I remember recently there's been a couple that I haven't applied for that they were, they were, and there's a current one now, and I can't re quite remember what it is. They're they're clearly looking for traditional sculpture. No, oh. um, and it's so cool. they they are out there. Yeah, I, so yeah. So look a lot. You'd have to like make sure you see every single. Uh, public art commission out there by going to those four sites that I mentioned that list that aggregate all the public art commissions. It is interesting how a lot of these um, uh, sites require, require, you know, permanency in the work. They always say low maintenance, permanent, low maintenance, permanent. And, uh, and we very well know that uh, they're, you know, considering the cost and how much Usually it's offered like say a hundred thousand. Um, you're just looking at limitations there for, for and, and that's part of the reason why I stayed with bronze or metal because I, feel, I figure, uh, yeah, that's gonna be low maintenance, but it just tends to fit in a category of tradition. And, and now we're looking at glass, we're looking at other materials, but then you have to consider where the work goes and how it's going to survive outdoors with low maintenance and permanence. Well, yeah, yeah and I don't think, I think for sure your work is maintenance is um, going to fulfill the maintenance requirement just because it is made out of traditional materials. I think it's, it's the, you know, pushing yourself more to um, having it you know, I didn't look, I didn't do a thorough look at your portfolio, but there was some work in there that, that really edged towards more being more distinctive of your, of a style and a, a mood for, for lack of a better word. Thank you so much for your oh, you're welcome. <laughs> okay, one second, here we go. So this comes from um, Oleg. It seems often public art agencies placing art calls are just doing it because it's the policy to do so. At the same time, they have an, an artist in their mind already. How often does this happen? It doesn't happen very often. There, um, I, I've seen it happen where it looks like once in a blue moon, I'll see an RFQ that I'll think like, I'll sort of suspect, wow, this seems like it was written for so and so, I'm not even gonna apply, or, um, or I, I'm just like I had one recently. It's like I'm not even gonna apply for this because I know that Luftwerk's gonna apply and they're gonna they're gonna get it because they're so good. And I'm like, you know what? They're very busy. They might not apply. And then I've seen things where it just looked like a shoe in for somebody else, and then somebody else, and then somebody else one. So the moral of that story is you need to always apply and don't let that self talk get you down. And the other reason public art, unlike the gallery world, is, is as close to a level playing field as you're going to find. Um, because there's so much oversight. I mean, they, they have to have like, and the committees are different every time. It's not like they have this cabal of, of people who are sitting around the table. It's like, if it's a library, they will be the librarian and then there'll be like someone from the community and, and, um, and, uh, the public art administrator doesn't say anything. They sit off to the side. They're not allowed to give their opinion. I mean, they might, in, in, but they, they don't have a vote. And uh, it would be really, is just, 
it would just be as unseemly for them to push the committee as it would be for like the judge in a jury to start pushing the jury to a verdict. Um, there's, there's, and uh, you know, it would, it would be, um, part of it is just that these are norms, but part of it, it would also be that would be against the law, against the ordinance for um, it not to be community driven. So uh, yeah, never, every, every time you, you tell yourself that this looks like it's rigged for somebody else, uh, talk yourself out of that. I'd look within on that one. Like, why are you trying to talk yourself out of applying to this? Well, I do have actually personal experience and reason for this question was uh, San Francisco Art Commissions, about a couple of years ago, placed art call for Treasure Island. There was a couple of opportunities. One of them, $1 million, another one, $2 million. Something like this doesn't happen often. A lot of Bay Area artists were interested. Uh, they got probably about 500 submissions for this request for qualifications. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a couple uh, meetings with artists, uh, site visit, uh, talking in details about opportunities and what they're looking for. But it's ended up actually in hands of blue chip artists like Andy Goldworthy and somebody else from Japan and Europe. But point is, it was clearly they had already those artists on their mind. So what's the point to get together a bunch of artists from Bay Area, do this, do that, if anybody actually they were already thinking about somebody else. That was the reason for my question. I'm just asking oh, yeah. how things like this do happen. What you just said wasn't proof that this was wired. The budget was proof that they were looking for blue chip artists and that's why I didn't apply for that call. Um, you know, my hat's off to someone who's applied to that call and hasn't, didn't do, didn't recognize right away that they were looking for a big name artist for such a high profile thing. I'm sure that like tons of other big name artists applied and I'm sure they invited big name artists to apply. Um, but I, I just don't think it was rigged. I think they probably, it was probably, it might have been rigged in the sense that there were 15 blue chip artists who they were seriously looking at and they picked those two. Um, but yeah, that was written written in the, on the wall from the beginning that there was gonna be a blue chip artist um, chosen for that one. But it sounds like they just, they played it by the book. And I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying is like, they do that as a cover. They will have like the call for artists and the community meeting and the whole thing. Right. Uh, they have to go through due process. Um, but I can't, I guess I just can't believe knowing the reputation of the San Francisco Art Commission that they would have somebody picked all, out already, es especially if, I don't know who was on the committee. I mean, sometimes it's rigged in the sense that they'll have like a blue chip art dealer and a blue chip curator. And I mean, it's like they have this blue ribbon committee and those, those guys are gonna default towards a blue chip artist. Um, and they might throw somebody into the mix as a wild card who hasn't done something like that, but at the end of the day, you know, who are they gonna spend their money on? Somebody with name recognition, because that's what that big budget is for. You know, once in a blue moon, something like uh, the Vietnam Memorial will come along where uh, an unknown artist will just blow everybody out of the water. Um, I haven't, that's the only story I know about about that, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Thank you. All right, we have quite a few more in the chat. So, and this one's from Sophie. Do you have suggestions on how to find art consultants to further your suggestion to Dora? It seems like a tough scene to break into and make connections. It is not. I love working with art consultants. Um, I wrote this article <laughs> 
a while ago for this obscure little publication in Chicago, but you can still find it online. It's called The Seven Secrets to Working with Art Consultants. Um, and I, I wanted it to be like, you know, a Cosmo <laughs> magazine headline or something. Um, it's, so I, I wrote everything I know about how to do that uh, there. And I, I worked with, I worked mostly with art consultants um, with my paintings. And I've built up such a stable of art consultants to work with over the years that I, I haven't looked for any recently because I just keep getting such steady work from them. But the way you find art consultants is you Google art consultants or you Google art advisors and you um, look at their websites and you take a real honest look at your, your work and you decide if your work fits with what they fit, but the, what they're looking for. If you find an artist who's like only collecting blue chip artists, well, don't, and you're not a blue chip artist, <laughs> don't submit your work to them. Um, if you find an artist who's like an art consultant who's like dealing in schlock and you don't want your work uh, shown next to work like that, and a lot of, and a lot of them do, like they're, they're artists, they're not even artists, they just like make, work they don't even use their real names and um it it shows up in, in different places but they're like but most art consultants are are very much in between they're they're catering towards the carriage trade they work for a lot of interior designers and the people who can afford to hire interior designers and then what you do is you just simply and they're they're like uh they're always looking always looking for new work and um it's so much more pleasant and easy and, and direct to break into than trying to find a gallery and do that whole kabuki dance with the gallery. And so then once you find an art consultant whose work has a, a you'll know it when you see it, it's like porn. <laughs> um, you'll know it when you see it, you just, um, you'll see work that you like. You might even see other artists that you recognize in there. Um, or work that, that looks sort of similar to yours. It'll be a vibe. And then you just email them and say, I've checked out, I've, I've looked at your work and I think there might be an affinity for us to work together. Um, here's the link to my website. And then you um, attach like a couple of images. And um, if you never hear from them again, that's their way of saying no. And so you don't bug them and um, you just send it and forget it and you might be pleasantly uh, surprised more often than not you are because you've already done your homework and you already know that there's an affinity with with that work what our consultants say over and over and over again is how many inquiries they get from artists who literally and obviously have never looked at their website and they they hate that and then you're on their shit list forever so just do like and it's fun just sit there and watch TV at night and Google and look up art consultants and you'll see like a whole bunch that don't fit. And then they'll be like, you know, what is that baby bear or mama bear anyway, where it's just right. And then um, just Goldilocks. Goldilocks, what? Oh, I thought it was the bears. Wait, is Goldilocks with the bears? Okay. Yeah, Goldilocks and the three bears. <laughs> but that was perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. And before I an, um, ask the next question, I just want to remind everyone, if I've read yours aloud, but you feel I haven't quite captured the nuance of the question, you can absolutely unmute. Um, so this one, can you please remind us of the four main organizations that post calls for public art? They are Call for Entry, uh, which is CAFE, but I think you have to Google callforentry.org. And um, that's commonly called uh, Call for Entry. And it also lists a lot of galleries, um, you know, uh, it lists a lot of exhibition competitions and stuff too, which I, I don't look at, but it's also a good thing to do with your studio work. Um, and then uh, publicartist.org. Coda work, C O D A W O R X, and anyartist.org. And those, and then for culture um, up in uh, Seattle, 
is the number four and then culture. They send out a good aggregate list. And then some of the larger arts are, um, I don't see as much anymore because so, because um, they're really, these four big ones really kind of capture all the um, calls for entry. However, really make sure you know every single airport, transit agency, county, state, city, public guard organization in your region because they're the ones who'll send out regional calls and they might not have enough money um, to put in an application on one of these larger ones, like I said before. And everyone, I just posted a link in the chat at the ISC, we actually have an opportunities page. So we tend to aggregate from those sites um, for our own page as well as member submissions for opportunities as well. So if you've not explored that yet, please do so. Again, the link is in the chat. I also wanna add about uh, ISC, the website is tremendous. I even mentioned it in my book because it's a great place to find fabricators and also the magazine because the, the big fabricators and some of the small ones you know, advertise in there. And we have regional um, opportunities as well in there. Okay, let me go back up to our next question. Um, this is from Michael again. When you are looking at opportunities, how do you parse them? What is the first question you ask yourself? What is the budget? <laughs> and then the next thing is, what are they asking for? Like if they're asking for a suspended piece or a water piece or something like that, it's like, or if it's a million dollars or uh, you know, those don't come along very often. It's like, that, that's, that's just too rich for my blood. I mean, that's just above my pay grade. I, I have no chance of winning that. I'm not even gonna go through the motions of applying for this. They would laugh at me <laughs> in, this, in the selection panel. It's like, whoa, does she think she is applying for this? You know, I apply for things that are a little bit more than what I've been able to do. And I'm inching my way up. I just did my first $800,000 commission. Um, but, that might put me in the running for a million dollar commission, depending on what it was, depending on if it was similar to the one I just did for 800,000. Um, that would be fine, but mostly, you know, I'm applying for those and I don't apply for anything for under 100,000 unless it's in my own backyard because by the time I pay myself my artist fee, which is 15% and travel, like what am I, you know, what am I going to make it out of like, you know, tongue depressors? It's just like, there, there's just like hardly any, money. <laughs> there won't be any money left to make the art. So, um, so the budget and then what, what it is they're looking for. Those are the two things. And then, then it kind of like, then I go deeper into there. If those, if those two things fit one time, oh my God, though, I was looking at something and it was $30,000 and I thought, you know, I'm just going to read this. It turned out that was just the artist fee. They wanted, uh, that was the design fee for, um, to come up with a concept that then their contractor or somebody they already had would fabricate. And I'm so glad I didn't throw that away. Um, I don't, I can't remember what it was or if I won or lost or, I mean, or I, I would remember if I won, but I can't remember if I was a client or if they've gotten back to me yet about it, but that sort of thing. Well, then I have more to say about that, but I go into that in depth in my book, but that's an excellent question. Um, is it 15% for the artist out of a project typical? Um, yeah, it is. Although in the back of my book, I asked a whole bunch of experienced public artists what, how they arrive at the budget, and, uh, but they, the fee that they pay themselves. And it's just all over the place. It's crazy. It's like, I'm just like 15% is easy for me to do the math. It kind of like over the year, it adds up to ma making a living. Um, so that's what I do. But other people can do other things. Like some people say 20% and then that includes their travel and whatever. Yeah, the formulas that people use are all different, but sometimes you'll see um, an art, that's kind of the acceptable 
um, number, like even an art, they kind of like build that into the budget, that that's what an artist is gonna pay themselves, 15 to 20%. That's another thing to watch out for. I mean, there's some that are like, they forgot to put money in for the artist. <laughs> and so, yeah, I don't apply for those. Okay, we have a, another question from um, the Bobby Zokaida studio. How, uh, kind of following up on the previous question, how do you decide how much time to devote to how many opportunities? Um, do you deep dive and customize your application for a small subset of interesting opportunities or send out a more boilerplate packet to as many opportunities as possible? I never, ever, ever do boilerplate. Um, I always do, um, it used to take me like four days to put a packet together. And most of that was writing the letter of interest and doing a little bit of research on the site, you know, seeing if I have an affinity for it. Um, and now it takes me about eight hours, between four to eight hours. The letters of interest are coming faster to me. I'm beginning to be less self-conscious about them. I'm starting to just like, you know what, <laughs> I'm, ex I'm an experienced artist now. I'm just gonna like write what I feel about this opportunity. Um, I do what I call the dance of the seven veils, which is I, lots of times I'll apply for something because I already am so excited. I mean, I don't apply for anything unless I'm excited about doing it or can kind of envision what it would be. And, um, but I don't tell them that in the, in the letter because they'll be like, this is just a call for qualifications that we're not asking for ideas yet. And also, I just want to hold that close to me because I'll tell you like nine out of 10 times, I'll, I'll just be like, yes, this is exactly what this, this project needs. And then I'll go do the research. I'll meet with the committee. Um, I'll have an interview as a finalist. And then I'll, be, I'll get all this information from the people who actually live and work in that site. And it'll be like, oh, I was completely off base what my initial idea was. And so then I'm excited about this other thing because I've gotten this feedback from, from the committee. So to answer your question, um, the, the more, you, more you do of them, the faster you get at them. I consistently apply for 30 a year. I just went back and looked because I, I archive all of my applications. Um, and I went back and looked and it's like, it was always like 30 a year. It's like, what is this? Because um, that's just how many I find that fit. And out of those 30, I might be a finalist for three or at a good year, maybe six. And I might win in a good year, three or two. Other people are more than that, I think. Um, but that, that's what my average is. Okay, do you use... Um, any particular software for managing your projects? I, um, well, for my studio work inventory, I use Artwork Archive, which is outstanding. I can't live without it. It's either, I would have to pay a studio assistant to um, keep up with all of the, the images and where the work is going and all of that. Um, no, I have a really bad, uh, I just use Excel spreadsheets and I use QuickBooks to manage my projects. And then um, I, my fabricators are my project managers. So they deal the, with the nitty gritty of, of all of that. Yeah. But it's just as far as like when to send an invoice and getting the insurance and all those, those other little things. I um, have a project I either, I, I had to hire a project manager for one in Maryland. It's the first time I've, I've done that. But the fabricator itself, like Mosaica, they project manage all the, pro everything themselves for me. So to follow up on that question, um, do you do most of your own installation work or do you hire that out? I don't do anything but come up with the concept. So the highest, best use of my time is to just keep applying for things and getting to do the fun part, which is coming up with the art concept. I'm not interested in building the work or installing it or getting on a forklift or a cherry picker or whatever. Um, 
to me the the concept and also just the uh, relationship with a, a really good fabricator. You know, you you become friends with a fabricator after you've used them for a while. I, I've used Vector here in Chicago, um, has been my fabricator, RGB lights in Chicago. We've worked together on several projects. Um, Wisconsin Terrazzo is my Terrazzo fabricator. Um, so yeah, they just they just handle the whole thing. And the person who's having the work done, uh, is that you having the work done in China? I mean, maybe, you know, it, it could be they're just an all-in-one type service and you don't need a client rep, but the, the third world countries are a little bit, you gotta keep an eye on them. Yeah, when I vetted them with uh, a couple of the people that work with them here in the States, they said that the uh, fabricator was fabulous, uh, the work was good, uh, and that the thing that tripped them up was the people at the port of entry. Oh, I'm having a flashback. <laughs> oh, dear God. No, you need an expediter. You're going to work with an expediter? I'm trying to, my RNL is mute, my usual shipper domestically. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've got an international guy who will um, meet the container at the port of Chicago and and then get it down here. You know, it sounds like you've got a, a tried and true fabricator that comes with good recommendations and has already been vetted by someone else. So you might be able to relax a little bit beyond what I said you need to do. I just know what it was like when I was doing the rugs in Nepal and China. Uh, I like to uh, measure twice and cut once. Yes, well said. I think we have time for about one more question. If you didn't get to ask yours, this recording will be posted in the forums on our website. So keep it in mind, write it down because you can always ask it there. I know Lynn will be checking in for a little bit. Um, so final question, uh, going back to consultants, uh, do they usually charge an upfront fee or do they take a percentage of anything that is sold? They take a percentage of anything that's sold. And the reason they like working with me is because I just give them 50%. I don't haggle with them. A lot of um, artists give them a hard time because they, uh, it's like, you're not a gallery. You don't have a bricks and mortar gallery, but I'll tell you, they earn every cent of when they to the hunt down and close a sale. I'm happy to give them 50%. Also, my work is, is priced so that, it's priced so that it's, it's market rate, um, it's priced, you know, it's priced for where I'm at in my in my career, um, and and for the clientele who who buys my work, I wouldn't call them collectors. They wouldn't call themselves collectors. They're just people who want nice real art around them. Um, they don't care if it's going to be worth something on the secondary market one of these days. They don't care if they're going to they're not going to leave their um, collection to a museum. Um, these are just like the the big middle of of people who, who like to have art around them and who like to support artists who, um, they, they might not need to come to my studio, but they, you know, they, they just like to know it's a, a real person who's a serious artist. So 50% um, commission to art consultants. Now as sculptors, here's something really tricky that I have a hard, I've had a hard time with. Um, one time with my mosaics, there are a lot of fabrication costs with my mosaics. And I've only worked with one art consultant with my mosaics. And she was a, a very well-known, very experienced art consultant. And all of a sudden, she just couldn't grasp the concept of um, it should be 50% commission above once you take out the cost of fabrication. She was like, you know, the budget is $30,000. I should get, I should get 15, I should get 50% of that. I'm like, yeah, but it's going to cost, you know, $25,000 <laughs> to make this piece. She just like wouldn't have it. Um, she's like, well, my, you know, my income structure is such that I can't do a project for less than 50% commission. It's like, but it doesn't, it's not, a, it's like, oh God, it was hard. So I ended up just eating it. I made nothing. And, um, that was, you know, in the days when 
I just thought, you know, I just need to get this thing in my portfolio. I didn't lose money, but it was like, this, I just need to get this thing in my portfolio. I, this is a really famous art consultant. I want to work with her. But um, yeah, I never, she never asked me again for anything. So I don't know what the moral is there. And just a quick word back to fabricators. Um, we at the ISC have prepared a lot of resource pages for you on our website. So I put the link um, to our fabricators resource page in the chat. Um, so you can check that out. I don't know. I just want to say in closing that I, I really, that I think these questions were so substantive and I, I feel like you got to um, some things I, I think you need to know. Um, I mean, just speaking from things that when I didn't know stuff, <laughs> you're asking questions that you that are really going to be helpful for you to know. And I, I think, um, I hope that there weren't any like, huge questions that weren't unanswered. I frankly can't think of any that, that weren't asked that you should know. Um, I probably will after we hang up. But uh, right now, I, I just feel like this was a, a really, like as we all, we all did this is what I'm trying to say. We all made the, this, the agenda for this talk. And I think you all did a really good job of that, of covering this, the, the ground. Thank you very much, Lynn. Really appreciate that. And I am absolutely sure that everybody got a lot out of it. I think the Q&A style is brilliant because you could lecture away and people are thinking, oh, I hope I get a chance to ask a real question that helps me, so. Yeah, that 10 minutes at the end. Okay, now questions? Yeah. You know, after like somebody's been droning on for, you know, 45 yeah. minutes. I'm gonna make my talks much shorter from now on with Q&A. <laughs> I do have a couple of things that I would like to say. Don't forget Lynn has a book. We gave away six last month and um, you can just look it up on Amazon. Um, we don't have any more to give away, but thank you for that, Lynn. Um, there are a couple of things coming up, I think, which are, tell, which are gonna dovetail this. We're working with public art um, program in Phoenix, Arizona. We haven't set a date yet, but we're working with her. And we will do once a week for a month, she will critique your portfolio for, pu for a public art um, entry. So they can never do that afterwards because they're not allowed to in their state, but it's a great way for you to actually get in front of her as well. Um, and to get a sort of answer on your portfolio of how you might change it, uh, move it around, and maybe even think about there's a possibility there of a commission. She's definitely looking for artists. So take advantage of that and have someone that's in the know um, re, uh, critique your portfolio. And that's what will be once a week for a month. We haven't got the month yet. Um, and then I think what came today was, and it's always a huge question, is how do we deal with working with international fabricators. So what I'd really like to do is get an artist that works with fabricators in China all the time, and then maybe they could do a talk similar to Lind. Um, I think that might be helpful. So, and it, I think Nicole will send you out a survey, survey. So if you have any other ideas that have come from this, please do make sure you let Nicole know because we're building this around what it is that you want. Um, and if you're not a member, become a member because this is, it's really important for us to continue this type of programming with support. So get someone else to be a member too. So please, please help us. Help us help you. Back to you, Nicole. And thank you very much, Lynn. Really appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yeah. So before we let you all escape for the day, um, as Johanna mentioned, we'd love feedback from you. So I did put the link in the chat a couple of times. If you just click on it, it's like a, a few questions that um, we would love to hear from you on. And as a reminder, um, this will be available in our forums um, probably later in the week. We have an ISC Connect forums 
Um, so that's where the recording will be and the chat scram, uh, transcript, excuse me, as well. So if you miss something, uh, you can rewatch and also reread. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Lynn. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lynn. Bye -bye. You're welcome.